This lecture, I think, starts with a series of preliminaries. Uh, but uh, so, the, in the technical term for preliminaries of this kind in literary study is prolepsis. That is to say, the form of anticipation, uh, which in a certain sense covers what will be talked about later. Uh, they are uh, prolepses of this kind. Uh, I, first, I wanted to say that in entering upon the phase of this course, which concerns a series of particular identities as perspectives, as points of departure for thinking about the literary text and, of course, for thinking about identity itself, um, we come upon a, a, a form of, of critical endeavor which is, in practical terms, incredibly rich uh, and productive. Uh, it is simply amazing how, as Jonathan Culler once put it, reading as a woman or reading as an African American or reading as uh, any of the other uh, uh, s sort of uh, focuses of identity that we're going to be talking about. It's simply amazing how this kind of reading, if it's done alertly, transforms everything. That is to say, it has uh, an incredible practical payoff. Um, you know, last time, uh, in the context of the new historicism, uh, Stephen Green Greenblatt's brilliant anecdote begins with Queen Elizabeth saying, I am Richard II. Know you not that? Whoa! Well, I mean, Stephen Greenblatt um, isn't concerned in investigating uh, a pronouncement of that sort from the standpoint of feminist criticism, or indeed uh, from the standpoint of something we'll be taking up later on, gender theory. Uh, but still, it's rather an amazing thing for Queen Elizabeth to say, isn't it? Uh, it suggests, really, that, a, that, it's, that it's after all remarkable that she, a woman, uh, would find herself in a position not so much uh, needing to endure the kind of suffering and peril that her own sex has traditionally endured, but uh, rather end uh, p potentially enduring the suffering and peril that one would experience in the masculine gender position made perhaps even more interesting and complicated by the fact that Elizabeth knows perfectly well that despite the rarity of her being Richard II, uh, it's nevertheless not a unique position. She has sub subjected Mary, Queen of Scots, to precisely that position. She has deposed uh, and beheaded her, ultimately, uh, in just the way that she fears the Earl of Essex will depose and behead her. So the way in which uh, this remark, uh, I am Richard II, know you not that, uh, so easily commandeered and made use of from the standpoint of the new historicism, can uh, come to life in a completely different way when we think about it uh, as a question of a gendered experience um, is, I think, in itself a fascinating one. Now, um, at the end of the last lecture, just as by way of further preliminary, um, I told a little fib. I said that there were no women in Tony the Tow Truck. And of course, in your prose text, the one that you've been clutching to your bosom feverishly for the entire semester, uh, in your prose text, there are no women. There are just guys talking. However, if to the prose text, and I've told you about these, you add the illustrations, uh, and this is one of them, roughly speaking, I did it from memory, um, uh, if you add the illustrations, you have to realize that it's not just the cars, you see the little smiles on the faces of the cars, it's not just the cars that are happy about what's going on when Bumpy finally comes along and pushes Tony, uh, but it's the houses in the background. The houses in the background, which have been expressing disapproval uh, at the reactions of Nito and Speedy to the predicament, there are big frowns on the faces of those houses in that illustration, and now pr express beaming approval when the morally correct thing is done. Now, in the Victorian period, and in a certain sense I think Tony the Tow Truck in this regard harkens back to the Victorian period, there was a poet named Coventry Patmore who 
actually a rather good poet, who became notorious, however, in the feminist tradition for having written a long poem in which he describes woman as the angel in the house. You probably, you're probably familiar with that expression, but the idea is an idea which is also, I think, embodied uh, in, the, in a monumental book of some 25 years ago by Anne Douglas called The Feminization of American Culture. Uh, the idea is that moral and aesthetic and cultural values are somehow or, an or another in the hands of women uh, in the drawing room at the tea table dictating uh, to the agencies of society, all of which are strictly male prerogatives, uh, what a proper ethical sense of things ought to be. In other words, the role of the angel in the house is not just to wash the dishes and take care of the kids, although that's a big part of it. The role of the angel in the house is also to adjudicate the moral aspect of life at the domestic level. And that's exactly what these houses, obviously inhabited by angels, how else could they be smiling and frowning, uh, that's what these houses uh, are doing. And so it is the case, after all, that there are women in Tony the Tow Truck. All right, now, as I say, this moment is not exactly a crossroads uh, in our syllabus. It's not like moving from language to psyche to the social, because obviously we're still very much in the social. In fact, it's not even as though we haven't hitherto encountered the notion of perspective. Uh, obviously, we have in all sorts of ways, but particularly in the work of Bakhtin or Jameson, uh, we're introduced to the way in which class conflict, that is to say being of a certain class, therefore having an identity, gets itself expressed in literary form dialogically gets itself expressed even as the expression of e either as the expression of conflict uh, between or among classes uh, or as a more cacophonous but and yet at the same time very frequently harmonious uh, chorus of voices of the sort that in uh, notions of carnal carnivalization uh, and other such notions one finds in Bakhtin. In other words, the way in which the language of a text, the language of a narrative or of a poem or of a play uh, gets itself expressed is already, as, as we've encountered it, uh, a question of perspective. That is to say, it needs to be read with notions of identity, in this case notions of class identity, uh, in mind if it's to be understood. Well, what's interesting though, what's also interesting though about turning to questions of identity is that perhaps more sharply now than hitherto, although I have been at pains to point out certain moments in the syllabus in which one really does arrive at a crossroads and you've got to take, you, can't, you simply can't take both paths. Uh, nevertheless, uh, within the context of thinking about identity in these ways as literary theory, we begin to feel uh, a, an increased competitiveness among perspectives. I'm going to be pointing, out, pointing this out from time to time in the sequence of lectures that we now undertake. But from the very beginning, there's a, 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 a sense of competition between Actually, uh, a competition which is in some ways unresolved to this day, uh, for example, between the feminist and the Marxist perspective. That is to say, what is the underlying determination of identity and consciousness? Is it class or gender, just for example? And this is not a new topic. This, is not, this isn't a topic that we stumble on today um, uh, as a result of some belated sophistication we've achieved. Listen to Virginia Woolf on page 600 of A Room of One's Own, where she says, top of the left-hand column, 
For genius like Shakespeare's is not born among laboring, uneducated, servile people. It was not born in England among the Saxons and the Britons. It is not born today among the working classes. How then could it have been born among women whose work began, according to Professor Trevelyan, almost before they were out of the nursery, who were forced to it by their parents and held to it by all the power of law and custom? Yet genius of a sort must have existed among women as it must have existed among the working classes. Now, in a way, Wolf is pulling her punches here. She's not saying class has priority over gender, nor is she saying gender has priority over class. If we're to understand the history of the oppression of women uh, or the history of the limits on the forms of women's expression. Uh, she's pulling her punches, and yet at the same time, I think we can see a point of view in Wolf's Room of One's Own, which is, after all, rather surprising. Think of the title. Think of the later title of a tract in some ways similar about so possible, the possible scope for contemporary activity for women, Three Guineas. Uh, these titles are grounded in material circumstances. Wolf stands before her audience, her Oxbridge audience of women, and says all she really has to say is just this one thing. If you're going to expect to get anything done in the way of writing or in the way of any other activity that's genuinely independent of patriarchal limitation, you've really got to have 500 pounds a year and a room of your own. That's all she really says she has to say. In fact, as you read through the six chapters of A Room of One's Own, you find that as if uh, on an elastic band, after the extraordinary range of impressionistic thinking that each chapter manifests, she is pulled back to this one particular, as she sees it, necessary factual precondition, material precondition. You want to get anything done? You're not Jane Austen. You're not, a ge you're not a genius sitting in your parlor whisking your, your, your novel in progress under a piece of blotting paper every time a servant comes into the room. You know, you're not like that. You really do need today the independence of having 500 pounds and a room of your own. In other words, I think one could show that even in a room of one's own, which is, which is, if not the greatest, certainly the most eloquent uh, sort of feminist uh, treatise on the conditions of women's writing ever written, one could show that even in that, uh, there is a certain priority given to the perspective of class as opposed to the perspective of gender. Uh, gender uh, will continue uh, to be conditioned by the effects of money and power. If, in fact, something isn't done, let's face it, to redistribute money and power on this view. And this is a perspective which, by the way, is even clearer in Three Guineas, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and suggesting that um, despite uh, its main agenda, which is a feminist one, that underlying that, there is a sense of the priority of Class. These sorts of tensions continue uh, to haunt not just feminist criticism, but other forms of criticism having to do with other forms of identity, really, to this day. Uh, conferences uh, featuring this variety of perspectives very typically uh, develop into debates on precisely this issue. And the one-ups persons of conferences of this kind are always the one who somehow, ones who somehow get in the last word uh, and say, you're all naive. Uh, you suppose that this is the basic issue, but there's an underlying issue which is the basic issue. Uh, and that's the one that I'm going to demonstrate must absolutely prevail. It's not necessarily always uh, the Marxist card which is played in this context, although it frequently is. Uh, it could be some other card, but it's always a card played. It's always the last word at the conference, which makes everybody go away and say, oh, I, I thought this was about women. Oh, dear. It must be about something else. And we will, uh, and, and, and we will have to come back to that because, uh, in a way, the material we cover today and the way that we're enabled to discuss it by its own nature uh, 
uh, is something that uh, calls for another lecture. Uh, and a lecture that we will uh, actually provide. Uh, there's a very real sense, as I hope to show by the end of the lecture, uh, in which uh, traditional, I call this classical feminist criticism, in which traditional or classical feminist criticism needs to be supplemented, perhaps in the Derridian sense, needs to be supplemented by something more, which is gender theory. Uh, and I'll try to, as I say at the end of the lecture, I'll try to explain uh, what, that might, what that might entail and then come back to it when we discuss uh, 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 Judith Butler and Michel Foucault uh, a few lectures from now. All right, so Room of One's Own is an absolutely amazing tour de force. Uh, it's actually one of my favorite books. I, I, I read it like a novel, and in many ways it is a novel. Um, uh, and I think immediately that might give us pause, because if Charlotte Bronte is to be called to task for tendentiousness, that is to say for writing from the standpoint of complaint, of perceived oppression, and if Charlotte Bronte's tendentiousness gets in the way of the full expression of what she has to say, which is to say the unfolding of a novel, uh, and if, as Virginia Woolf, I think actually rightly remarks, at least from an aesthetic point of view, we wonder why on earth Grace Poole suddenly appears after, after you know, the sort of Jane's diatribe about wishing that she could travel and wishing that her horizons had been broadened, somehow Jane, uh, uh, Virginia Woolf says, as Grace Poole uh, is out of place and that there's been, that, that, that there's been a rift uh, in the narrative fabric. Um, if this criticism of Charlotte Bronte is fair, and we'll be coming back to it uh, in other contexts, then of course it could be turned against the narrative, the choice of narrative style, of narrative approach in a room of one's own itself. Uh, this, I suppose, could only strike you forcefully if you read the whole of Room of One's Own, all six chapters, which I urge you to do um, because it's so much fun. If you read the whole of Room of One's Own, you'd say, well, gee, this is sort of a novel. Too. The speaker says, oh, call me anybody you like, uh, not unlike Melville's speaker saying, call me Ishmael, you can call me Mary Beaton, you can call me Mary Seaton, call me Mary Carmichael, doesn't really matter. Um, but I've had certain, ad certain adventures, at least that person speaking has had certain adventures which are fictitious. Um, or at least I reserve the right to, to have you suppose that they're fictitious. Uh, in other words, this is a narrative that moves quite by design in the world of fiction. In other words, Virginia Woolf is saying it really isn't true, as, as, as she tells us in the first chapter, that she, Mary Beaton, after sitting at the river, thinking, wondering what on earth she's going to tell these young ladies about women and fiction, um, as she's been thinking about that, finally she gets a little idea. It's like pulling a bit of a fish out of the river, uh, and the fish starts swimming around in her head. She becomes quite excited, and she walks away across the grass. At that point, up arises a beetle, uh, a formidable person, you know, wearing Oxonian gowns and pointing at the gravel path where she, as an unauthorized woman, should be walking as the grass is the province only for the men enrolled in the university. Uh, and so, and then she has repeated encounters of that kind. She goes to the library unthinkingly, uh, only to be told by an elderly wraith-like gentleman that uh, since she's a woman, she needs a letter of introduction to get in. Um, and, and so it's her day, uh, her fictitious day, thinking about what on earth she's to say to these young women about women and fiction uh, begins somewhat unpleasantly. Um, as a presented fiction. In other words, A Room of One's Own is, in a sense, a novel. It continues um, uh, with a very pleasant lunch that she has. She's been invited uh, to the campus as a distinguished writer. It's OK to be a novelist, um, uh, to be a woman who's a novelist, as long as you, uh, as, 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 as long as you don't uh, uh, rock the boat too much. Um, and in that respect, in that regard, she can have been invited to such a lunch, has a very pleasant lunch because it's provided by men uh, in an atmosphere which is designed for men. Then she goes to visit a friend who is uh, teaching at this fictitious college. 
Uh, she has dinner with the friend in that college's dining hall, uh, and the dinner is extremely inferior, inferior and plain. Uh, and then they go to her rooms, uh, and they start talking about the conditions in which this college was built. A bunch of women in the 19th century had all they could do to raise 30,000 pounds. No frills, thank you very much. None of them had any money. There were no major do donations. And so the grass never gets cut. The, br the, the brick is plain and unadorned. Um, and that's the way life is in this particular women's college. Uh, then uh, she, uh, the next day, she goes to the she goes to the library because she decides she's really got to find out something about what people think of women. Um, and so you know what, what you know what is a woman? I don't know exactly. So I'd better I'd better look it up in the library. And she finds out that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of men have written books about women. Uh, you know the inferiority of women. The more moral sensitivity of women, the lack of physical strength of women, on and on and on. And she lists them uh, as items in the library catalog, which actually are there <laughs> in the library catalog. Um, uh, all of them, of course, uh, getting themselves expressed in these hundreds and hundreds of books about women by men. Well, this is very frustrating, but as you can imagine, it's a cause, it's, a, it's an occasion for wonderful satire. Uh, one has to say tendentious uh, um, satire because obviously it's male bashing. Uh, and my point is, my point is that she wouldn't let Charlotte Bronte get away with that, you know. Charlotte Bronte has, Char Charlotte Bronte has to suspend her anger. Virginia Woolf wants to say, if she's going to get the whole of what's on her mind expressed. Well, Virginia Woolf, who is, of course, not sort of doesn't sound very angry, um, but you could well be mistaken about that. Uh, she's venting her anger in comic effects. Uh, Virginia Woolf allows herself, because that really is the case, uh, a measure of anger. Uh, so, so it is in that chapter. Then she goes home. Uh, and, the rest of, and the rest of the room of one's own takes place in one's home. She's in her study pulling books off the shelf of her library. Uh, and this is more or less chronological. It starts with, the, uh, with a time when she looks uh, where, uh, on the shelf where the women writers ought to be, and there aren't any women writers. Uh, and then later, yes, there are women writers. Uh, there are quite a few novelists. Uh, and then later, uh, in the 20th century, women writers get a little bit more scope for their activity. Um, and as she passes all this in review, uh, we continue to get her reflections on the state of literary politics possibility for women in literary history. So that is, that's the structure of A Room of One's Own uh, overall. And uh, it is within this structure, which is an impressionistic and narrative, undoubtedly novelistic structure. I mean, there are, pre there are precedents for it. Oscar Wilde's portrait of Mr. W.H. Is, is one in particular, but which is, um, w but which is um, in a, in a way, what it's talking about. It is a novella. Uh, and in the context of the novella, as I say, there's a certain tension or contradiction uh, in an author who is allowing herself tendentious opinions uh, while denying the right to have such opinions uh, on the part of one of her predecessors. As you can imagine, what she says about Charlotte Bronte has been, has been controversial uh, in subsequent feminist criticism. There are a number of ways in which feminist critics feel that uh, Virginia Woolf um, is misguided or needs uh, to be supplemented. Uh, and this is one of them. By and large, feminist critics uh, feel that Charlotte Bronte or any other writer has the right to be tendentious. Uh, we'll have more to say about uh, Virginia Woolf's criterion of androgyny, uh, uh, which is not thinking like either sex, in part. We'll come back to that. Um, but, fem but, but, but most feminist criticism has felt, uh, for a variety of, of, of reasons, that um, um, androgyny isn't necessarily the ideal uh, uh, toward which women's prose uh, ought to be aspiring. Uh, and take Virginia Woolf to task, therefore, for having taken this view of Charlotte Bronte. Now, yes, feminist criticism has taken 
around one's own to task in a variety of ways. But at the same time, and I think this is freely and handsomely acknowledged uh, by feminist criticism, it is amazing when you read the whole text and even when you read the excerpts that you have in your anthology, it is amazing how completely Virginia Woolf's arguments anticipate uh, the subsequent course of the history of feminist criticism. I just want to point out a few of the ways in which it does. Um, as Showalter points out, the first phase of modern feminist criticism uh, was the kind, of, the kind of work that primarily pays attention to men's treatment of women in fiction. Uh, uh, Mary, Ellman's, uh, Mary Ellman's book of, of, uh, of, of 1968 called Thinking About Women, Kate Millett's uh, Sexual Politics uh, in 1970 are both books which, uh, um, which uh, focus primarily on sexist male novelists uh, who, uh, whose demeaning treatment of women uh, is something that, that the feminist perspective, perspective needed to bring out. Uh, this criticism is superseded in uh, Elaine Showalter's account by what she calls and prefers uh, gyno criticism or the gyno critics. Uh, and gyno criticism is not so much concerned with men's treatment of women in fiction as with the place of women uh, as writers in literary history and as characters, uh, regardless whether they're characters in men's or women's books, in their own right in uh, the history of fiction. In other words, in other words gynocriticism turns, uh, turns the topic of feminist criticism around 19, late 60s and, and, 70, and early 70s from the history of oppression by men to the history of a or the women's tradition. Now this, this sense of the, of the unfolding of things, it seems to me, is already fully present in Wolf. She too wants to talk about the possibilities for women writers, about the need uh, for women writers to feel that they're not alone, and above all, at the same time, however, uh, she frames this emphasis on the woman's perspective. She frames it with the sort of, uh, of, of, of trenchant, uh, frequently satirical uh, observations about men's treatment of women, uh, men's way of demeaning women and keeping them in their place, um, as, for example, uh, all the men, most of them professors, who wrote uh, books about women, uh, as she discovered uh, in the British Library. All of this is very much in the tradition of that first phase of feminist criticism that Showalter identifies uh, with uh, Elman uh, and Millet and others of that generation. So the capaciousness of Wolf's approach um, is, uh, in one sense, can be understood as precisely her ability to bridge uh, both sorts of modern tradition, uh, no longer chron chronological uh, as Showalter presents them as being correctly, but rather as a kind of simulta simultaneity uh, in, which, um, in, 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 in which the emphasis on, 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 on men's marginalization of women and the emphasis on uh, women's consciousness and traditions uh, can be uh, uh, set forth at the same time. Now, also in Virginia Woolf, there's, ha there's, there's what, um, uh, since the publication of the fascinating book by Sandra Gilbert and Susan Gubar called The Mad Woman in the Attic, this is also uh, a, an allusion to Jane Eyre. You remember Bertha, The Mad Woman in the Attic of, of Jane Eyre. Um, since the publication of uh, of the Mad Woman in the Attic, um, feminist criticism has has talked about the Mad Woman thesis. The idea, in other words, uh, that because they could not um, um, openly express themselves creatively as writers or as artists of other kinds, uh, women were forced to channel their creativity into subversive, devious, and perhaps psychologically self-destructive, as in, for example, Charlotte Perkins Gilman's uh, the, uh, the Yellow Wallpaper, uh, perhaps um, self-destructive 
forms. And uh, you find Wolf already on page, on page uh, 600, uh, it, just actually below the passage about class uh, and gender that I read uh, before, you find her touching on this mad woman theme long before uh, Gilbert and Gubar. She says, when, however, one reads of a witch being ducked, or of a woman possessed by devils, of a wise woman selling herbs, and then, of course, she adds, <laughs> and even of a very remarkable man who had a mother, there, in other words, uh, one strongly suspects that there's a person whose creativity has been oppressed uh, and uh, unfortunately channeled uh, in uh, unsocial or antisocial directions. Um, and this, uh, as I say, is, uh, is, is, is a tradition that's sustained. Uh, it still exists in Showalter when she says on page 1383, I mean, it's not just Gilbert and Gubar. Uh, in other words, when Showalter says on page 1383, um, she does. I can't say that I think she does. Uh, uh, yes, 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 yes. I, what I wanted to say about Showalter um, is that uh, in her gynocritical perspective, that is to say her, her insistence on our registering, chronicling, uh, becoming familiar as scholars with uh, the history of women as well as the history of women's writing, uh, the recognition of such forms of uh, repression as witchcraft, as madness, as herbalism, as whatever it might be, uh, need, to be need to be taken into account. Um, also very much on the mind of Wolf already, as it still is, particularly for Showalter, because this is Showalter's understanding of the task of gynocriticism, is the notion that one needs a tradition, that one of the great difficulties and shortcomings facing the woman's writer is that uh, yes, there are a few greats, the same ones always named, Austin, the Brontes, George Eliot. There are a few greats, but there is not a sense of an ongoing tradition, of a developing tradition within which uh, one could write. So that uh, Wolf on page 606, the right hand column, talks about um, the man's sentence. You know, the difficulty of coming to terms with, uh, with uh, not having not just a room of one's own, but a language of one's own. Uh, toward the top of the right-hand column, perhaps the first thing she would find, setting pen to paper, was that there was no common sentence ready for her use. All the literary models, all the models of novelistic prose, uh, most of them in any case, uh, are, 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 are engendered male um, because uh, the atmosphere of writing, uh, and this is a point that we'll be getting to soon, the very fact of writing uh, is something that we have to understand as having a male stamp on it. Uh, further down the right-hand column, that is a man's sentence. She's just quoted a long sentence. That is a man's sentence. Behind it, one can see Johnson, Gibbon, and the rest. It was a sentence that was on suited for a woman's use. Charlotte Bronte, with all her splendid gift for prose, stumbled and fell with that clumsy weapon in her hands. George Eliot committed atrocities with it that beggar description. Jane Austen looked at it and laughed at it and devised a perfectly natural, shapely sentence proper for her own use and never departed from it. Thus, with less genius for writing than Charlotte Bronte, she got infinitely more said. Jane Austen, and by the way, this is disputable because um, certainly it's possible to understand Jane Austen's prose style as emerging from the work of Samuel Johnson and Samuel Richardson in particular. Uh, so it is disputable. But at the same time, Wolfe's point is that, that, that Austen was able to shake herself free from this terrible problem of wanting to say something but finding uh, that one doesn't have one's own language, a language suitable to, uh, appropriated by and for and as one's identity for saying it. So I want to write as a woman, as a woman I want to say the things that a woman wants to say, but all I've got to say it with is a man's sentence. That's uh, Wolf's point. Um, 
And of course, it has, uh, it has uh, many uh, and long ramifications. It is, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm holding at bay um, the criticism of a great deal of this that uh, has to be leveled uh, at it by feminist criticism and gender, gender theory roughly since 1980. But in the meantime, uh, the ramifications are interesting and they are reinforced by the theoretically very sophisticated wing of feminist criticism that we call French feminism. Some of you may know the work of, uh, of Luce Irigaray, Iri Hélène Sissou. Uh, writers of this kind um, insist that there is such a thing uh, as women's language. Women write not just you know, with their heads and their phalluses, but with their whole bodies. Uh, women don't write uh, carefully constructed periodic sentences. Women write ongoing, paratactic, impressionistic, uh, uh, digressive, uh, ad hoc sentences uh, that this is a sentences without ego, uh, being without structure, more or less corresponding to being without ego. We'll come back to this in a minute and show Walter. But in the meantime, French feminism was willing to settle on and for an idea of women's writing and implicitly behind this idea, an idea of what a woman is that it's very easy to, to identify as somehow or another um, essentializing. Why can't a woman write uh, a rigorous periodic sentence? After all, that's the kind of sentence that Jane Austen did, in fact, write. Uh, why can't, why, why can't um, uh, in, in, a great, in, 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 in a whole variety of ways that one, that one might think of, why can't a woman, uh, if she is to be free to be whatever she wants to be, write a sentence which isn't necessarily of this uh, gendered feminine sort. Um, why does women's writing, in other words, have to be women's writing? It seems to me that, this, that, that it, is Fre it is French feminism and the, criti the possible critique of French feminism that Virginia Woolf is anticipating in advance when she embarks on this perilous idea of androgyny of the kind of mind that needs to be both male and female uh, and that needs to write in a way that Virginia Woolf says is actually very sexy uh, precisely in the moment when one is not thinking about one's sex. Uh, the moment, in other words, uh, when there's no longer a question of the man's sentence and the woman's sentence. I think it has to be said that although one could emphasize in a room of one's own, this sort of advanced criticism of French feminism and also of the idea that there is essentially something that we call woman, and I'm not through with that topic, I think it has to be said that although we could read a room of one's own in this way, at the same time we have to recognize an ambivalence on Virginia Woolf's part on this subject. There is a difference between her insistence that Jane Austen wrote like a woman, that, is, that she shrugged off the tyranny of the man's sentence and wrote her own sentence, uh, her own kind of sentence, a woman's sentence, regardless whether or not that is actually in literary historical terms true. Uh, the idea on the one hand that it's important to write like a woman uh, and the idea on the other hand that it's important to write androgynously. We have to, we, we have to concede, I think, to the impressionistic form of these lectures that she's giving. Uh, we have to concede that she wavers on this point. That there is that that somehow or another, well, it's very difficult to pin down in Wolf the question whether there is essentially something to be called women's writing, just as the question behind that whether there is essentially something to be called woman, or the question on the contrary whether the ideal of all writing is to shed as fully as it can precisely its gendered aspects. Uh, there, is, there is perhaps a, a kind of uh, creative or rich inconsistency on this point that it should be said one also finds uh, and needs to take into account in reading a, a room of one's own. All right, now 
getting a little closer to the uh, to uh, uh, to this whole question of beyond uh, the gynocritical, because uh, Showalter, for example, in talking about the history of the novel, uh, talks about those three phases. First, the fe the, the feminine. That the phase in which women try very much to write as though they were men by deferring completely to male values uh, in all the ways that they can, uh, perhaps um, introducing a kind of, uh, uh, again, um, angel in the house, uh, cultural um, uh, 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 benevolence and benignity into perspectives of men that can be sometimes rather militaristic and harsh, uh, but nevertheless hiding behind uh, frequently male names, Curavel, Acton Bell, George Eliot, and so on, uh, and uh, not really, uh, not really uh, entering into questions of, um, uh, of the place of women in society. Uh, Showalter then says this is a phase supplanted by uh, a feminist moment in the history of the novel, in which novels, as the late work of Mrs. Gaskell, for example, and other such novels, become tendentious, uh, and the place and role of women becomes the dominant theme of novels of this kind. Uh, supplant and by the way, uh, this takes uh, Wolfe's critique, critique of Charlotte Bronte a little bit out of chronology, because presumably Charlotte Bronte belongs to what Showalter is calling the female phase in the history of the novel. Um, but, uh, and, and so it's interesting that Wolfe finds a kind of proto-feminism damaging to the texture of Jane Eyre already in Charlotte Bronte's novel. And then finally, uh, what, what Elaine Showalter likes best, the supplanting of the feminist novel, because a Elaine Showalter too is nervous about the tendentiousness of fiction, uh, the supplanting of that by what she calls the female novel, um, which is the novel that simply takes for granted the authenticity and legitimacy of the woman's point of view, writes from that point of view, but as in Virginia Woolf, having shed or shaken off the elements of uh, uh, anger or adversary consciousness that uh, earlier uh, novels had typically manifested. Uh, and this is very much very similar in the history, th this history of the novel is very similar to what Showalter is doing with her sense of the history of recent feminist criticism. That's in two phases. First, the feminist, as she calls it, uh, when the treatment of, men, of women by men in fiction is the main focus. And then the gynocritical, which is the appropriation for women of a literary tradition. Showalter is at pains to point out that the most, much of the most important work of recent feminist scholarship, the feminist scholarship of the 1970s, is in simply the unearthing of and expanding of a canon of women's writing. Uh, not exclusively novelistic, because there had been a time uh, when um, the novel was sort of half conceded to women as a possible outlet for their writing, but this concession was accompanied by the um, by the sovereign assertion that they couldn't write poetry and plays. Uh, and so an expansion of the canon such that all forms of writing uh, are available and made visible and recognized as actually existing in a tradition uh, so that we can trace women's writing, as Showalter puts it, from decade to decade and not from great book to great book. Uh, so that there really is a tradition comparable to the male tradition that one can think about, think within, uh, and draw on as a creative writer oneself. Uh, so both Showalter's history of the novel and her history of modern feminist or modern <laughs> women's criticism, one had better say, uh, end at the point when it is still a question of the woman's perspective. But this raises a question. And I mean, and, and it's, and it, it's, it's uh, I've, I've been touching on it in a, variety, in a variety of ways. But it really raises the question that has to haunt thinking of this kind. And we're going to be encountering it again and again and again uh, as we move through other forms of uh, identity perspective in criticism and theory. It raises the question whether if I say that a woman or women's writing 
is of a certain sort. That is, that is, if I identify a woman in a way that I take somehow to be recognizable, let's say I identify a woman as intuitive, imaginative, impressionistic, sensitive, illogical, opposed to reason, a refuser of that periodic sort of subject predicate sentence that we associate with men's writing. I can appropriate that for women, like the French feminists, and I can identify women in so doing as such people. But isn't that simply inverting what men in Virginia Woolf's discoveries in the British Museum in the second chapter of A Room of One's Own? Isn't that just inverting all the negative values that men have attached to women all along? Isn't it ultimately to accept men's opinions of women, men's ways of saying that because they are avatars of reason, science, logic, uh, and all the rest of it, isn't it, isn't it a way of saying that the head is higher than the heart? And accepting, in other words, the lower or inferior status of this organ to this organ, even though one supposes oneself to have transvalued them and insisted in promoting women's consciousness that the heart is higher than the head. One hasn't done anything, in other words, to the essential identities that have governed patriarchal thought from the beginning. It is precisely this characterization of women that has enabled and engendered patriarchy. And so, and, and this is where the problem, this is where the theoretical problem arises. And it calls forth, it calls for, it seems to me, uh, a, a, a sense that somehow or another, one has to put the possibility, and there's really no other way to say it, and this is something that Judith Butler frequently says, and, 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 and people who work uh, in the mode of Judith Butler, one has to put the suggestion, but perhaps the best thing one can say as a feminist is, there's no such thing as a woman. There is no woman. Now, of course, this is perilous. And this, is what, and, this is, and this is what drives such, such an unfortunate wedge in the midst of feminist thought. In real life, in real material existence, there certainly are women. They are oppressed by laws, they are, they are oppressed by men, uh, and, their, and, and their, their rights and their very lives need to be protected with perpetual vigilance. The idea, in other words, the theoretical idea that there's no such thing as a woman is not an idea that can be sustained in life. And yet, at the same time, the implications of what the language of identity politics is always calling essentialism, the implications of saying woman is one particular thing, and it might be better if we said woman was one particular thing, but it was something other than what men have been saying she was all along. <laughs> but, but making the problem worth saying that woman is one particular thing, which is uh, just what men have always said she was, only it's a good thing. Right? That, 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 that positions of this kind taken up in this way, uh, despite the fact that they're absolutely necessary for practical feminism, for real world feminism, are nevertheless uh, detrimental to uh, a more sensitive theoretical understanding of gender um, and of the possibilities of gender. It's all very well to be, um, to be you know, intuitive and e emotional and, and, and impressionistic, uh, but one wants to say two things about that. In the first place, a guy gets to be that if he wants to, right? Uh, and in the second place, why does a woman have to be that, right? And it's perfectly clear. It's perfectly clear in both cases that there are exceptions which go vastly beyond the exception that proves the rule. Uh, it's perfectly clear that in both cases uh, there are sensibilities across gender that completely mix up uh, and, and, and discredit these categories. Uh, and so for all of those reasons, uh, there's a problem. Uh, just very quickly. I, I want to point out that, that, I mean, looking at Showalter's essay, that this is a bind, that criticism 
around uh, 1980 really hasn't gotten passed. I'm not going to take, it's time's up, I'm not going to take the time to quote passages. But notice uh, her animus, and here in a way we go back to the beginning, her animus against Marxism and structuralism on the grounds, and of course we've said this ourselves, on the grounds that both of them present themselves as sciences. Aha! They're gendered male. You know, uh, Marxism and structuralism aren't anything we want to have to do with because this is just uh, Virginia Woolf's beetle uh, raising its ugly head again and imposing its will through its superior rationality uh, on women. Uh, so we don't want any of that. What we want instead is a form of criticism. And this is what she says at the end of the essay on pages 1385 and 1386. What we want instead is a form of criticism that evades scientificity, a form of criticism that engages with the reality of texts and of the textual tradition, but doesn't trouble its pretty little head, doesn't trouble its head with theoretical matters. In other words, dissociates itself from the logical, from the from overarching structure, from scientificity. Showalter leaves herself in this position, in a certain, and 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 she leaves feminist criticism in this position as um, how might one put it, um, a colonized enterprise that can do anything it likes as long as it's not reasonable. Uh, and if that's and and and, and if that's the case, uh, then of course it imposes an essentializing limit on the possibilities of feminist criticism. Just as, of course, the characterization of men's criticism uh, in the way that it's characterized, needless to say, also imposes limits on that. Uh, fair and legitimate limits, or perhaps exaggerated limits, uh, is open to question. That's not nearly as important a point as the, the reminder uh, that um, there's a kind of marginalization of the possibilities for feminist criticism uh, involved in saying that it has to be uh, something other than the sort of thing that Marxist and structuralist paradigms make available. Uh, okay, now I think that uh, Henry Louis Gates will have a very, influenced by Bakhtin, will have a very interesting way of coming to terms with this question of what's available for a marginalized minority criticism uh, once it avoids or has succeeded in avoiding the terms of the mainstream criticism. Uh, and I want you to read Gates' essay uh, with that particularly in mind. Then we'll come back with the question of, as it were, the future of feminist criticism, feminist criticism in a way since 1980, uh, when we turn to the work of the gender theorists, uh, in particular Judith Butler. <laughs>